Hey everyone, on this episode of Beyond MD, we get into step two of the Burr real estate investing method, which is the first R, renovations. Now, before listening to this episode, you have to go back and listen to the initial episode on Burr investing, which was the previous episode with Quentin D'Souza. So a few quick things before diving into today's chat. First of all, why did I make these episodes on Burr real estate investing? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to be learning this content from the right people. And with all the access that we have to information, it's very easy to find videos with people who have invested in one, two, or three properties, and then they claim to know it all. I wanted to go out and find the right individual who has decades of experience and who is a trusted voice in the space. And I found Quentin D'Souza, and I'm very happy to have him on the show. Also, there is a lot of content on Burr Investing that is geared towards different U.S. markets, but I wanted to create an episode that was more geared towards Canadian investors. Second, I think if there's one thing I learned from 2022, it's that cash flow is really, really important. And when I look at the different ways of investing in real estate that we've already talked about on the show, we've talked about single family homes, we've talked about pre-construction condos. I do believe that if you do a burr the right way, then you can increase the likelihood of getting positive cash flow. And what has the last year shown us? Well, you've had real estate prices in decline, and you're going to go through stretches like this. So in my opinion, relying only on capital appreciation is not a sound enough strategy. I think you have to strive for some cash flow. I also want people to understand that you don't have to go out and do a burr. You don't have to follow these steps and invest in this way. You know me, I'm all about learning about as many things as possible, and I encourage other people to do the same thing. But remember, there are other ways to invest in real estate that are passive. You can invest in public REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. You can also invest in private REITs, and you can invest through private equity as well. Like we've talked about all of these methods on the show. These are passive ways that may appeal to some listeners. One thing I really want to emphasize is time. You need to make sure that you're using your time in an efficient way and you're, that you're using your time in a way that is in line with your core values. And I can tell you that when I first sat down with Quentin to chat about real estate investing, the first question he asked me was, Yathan, what are your goals in real estate investing and how many properties do you want to hold? And I basically told him, for me, it's going to be a handful of properties and that's it. And he was more than okay with that. He told me to stick with what I know, stick with the markets that I understand. And he emphasized that I also need to be using my time in a way that's in line with my value system. So I think that's critical. But for people who are going to go and try the Burr method, I truly hope that the content in all these episodes gives you a useful roadmap. And so with that, let's carry on with part two of Burr Real Estate Investing. And again, if you have not listened to part one, please go and listen to that before listening to this episode. Uh, Let's move on to the renovation. Now, this is honestly, when I look at the different steps in the Burr method, this is the one that I am most nervous about because I've never... I've never kind of tackled a renovation myself. It's so far removed from my day to day, but it's obviously an important part of the process. So when you're going to check out a unit, how do you get an accurate assessment of what what the cost for the reno is going to be? Do you suggest when you're seeing the unit that you kind of hire a contractor who will come and inspect the place with you? Just give us some guidelines, maybe in broad strokes. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I've done this a lot. So I've, I've, I don't know how I many, like I've done maybe like 30 duplex conversions or more over, over the years. So it's a little bit different for me, but what I suggest to people who are just starting out, especially if they don't have renovation experience is that they use a third party to come with them. It doesn't necessarily have to be a contractor. It could be another experienced investor. So somebody that's done duplex conversions before, not one, not two, but at least three duplex conversions before. So a friend or somebody who has experience doing that, that can, 
that help you. The other one would be hiring a contractor to come out and pay them $100, $200 to estimate the cost of the, re the repair I, or, or the renovation. Sometimes I even would have two or three people come out. So what I would do is um, I would have um, an inspection period where I, and this is where the market is now anyway. So you can have a, an inspection and during the inspection, I would say that I'm also bringing my contractors in to have a look at the unit. And at that time, I would have back to back contractors come in every half an hour and I would have two or three come into the same unit to give me uh, quotes. Um, it was it was sometimes a little uncomfortable because there would be an, one contractor leaving and another coming in, but I was paying them as well, right? And so it was uh, a way for me to like ensure that they got something out of it and then I got something out of it, which was the um, the quotes. And uh, that's that's you know really at the very beginning, you know I think that's an easy way of of doing it. The other one is uh, estimating by a, a per square foot cost, right? You know, you could say, um, you know, what does it what is it going to cost me per square foot to renovate this unit? It's it's a rough estimate. It's not really great, but it's something that is helpful. So let's say you have like a thousand square feet unit. You could say that, you know, per hundred, like it's about one hundred dollars per square foot to to renovate it, to get it up to the to, to the point where I could add. Maybe it's one hundred dollars per square foot to get a suite done. But and it's like. $50 a square foot just to to improve the uh, the space like uh, bring it up to to par or whatever your your standard is mm -hmm. so if you have a per square foot cost then it's an easy uh, estimate but it's really just like uh, it's a bulk estimate and, and the truth of the matter is once you you start to get into something you start to see behind walls what what's there it, there's going to be additional costs, right? So oftentimes we'll add about 10 or 15% just to uh, additional costs. You know, when we're doing duplex conversions, depending on what city we're in, we actually uh, add an additional cost just to deal with the, ins the city inspectors. So in, in, in Whitby, in Oshawa, we would add an additional 20% because the inspectors were ridiculous. They asked for like over the top stuff. And but if we did the same thing in Clarington, we wouldn't ha we would put maybe five percent because they, Very interesting. you know, they yeah. were uh, a lot easier to deal with. But having a contractor who's done many conversions in in a location helps you to 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 understand that piece, whereas um, somebody who hasn't won't understand that, you know, this dealing with the city and, and the permit process. Um, the other yeah. thing is um, when you get a property under contract with a purchase and sale agreement, you should also include a clause that allows you to apply for permits on uh, the, get the seller to apply for permits on your behalf so that, that you can cut down the permit wait time. Often what happens in a renovation is you end up taking possession of the property, then you do all your measurements, and then you go to the city, and then you're waiting another six weeks because they're, they're still giving you different types of excuses of why it takes so long to get something done. If you, at the purchase and sale time, um, once you go firm on the deal, you, you have a clause that says that, you know, this, um, you're... Uh, you can apply for permits on my behalf to do a basement suite, whatever it is. Then, you know, with that letter, you can go to the city. You can have your measurements during the inspection done. Then you, you take it, get the, um, you start the process for the application so that when you get to closing, you're actually ready to do the work right away instead of waiting. Because you're going to get into a lot of conflicts with contractors if you said that we're going to close on this but you can't actually start the work because you're waiting for um, the permits to come through from the the city which is taking longer and longer and more and more red tape that that's happening you know so it's something that you know you want to try to adjust for by cut when you're doing renovations time and money is the same thing if it takes you 
you know, twice as long to do, it's going to cost you just, it, it's an increase just as if it was an increase in cost because you're, you have to pay for financing. You're holding onto the property, you have no income coming in, right? It's costing you. So you, you, you want to be just as efficient as possible on getting the renovations done. That there's so much in there that I didn't even think about. So, <laughs> So, okay, apply for the permits well in advance because there's a time component there. And then let's say once you start, once you break ground in the renovation, let's say you have a 650 square foot basement unit, a one bedroom unit that you're going to create there nowadays with, I guess, still some some supply issues. How, how long does it take to actually create that unit now? Well, it depends on how how good you are and how you've arranged your trades, right? There, when you when you're doing a, a job, you create what's called the scope of work. The scope of work outlines exactly who is doing what and when they're doing it. It's kind of like um, like a project manager would have. Uh, all the different steps kind of laid out. Well, that's what you would do in your scope of work. Um, And uh, if you've laid it out properly, like I've done a full basement suite conversion in four weeks. That was the, my, my record, right. In in doing it. Um, And, um, but, but I have, I had all the trades because we were doing so many in a year. We're all lined up. I, you know, we would do uh, we would do the demo in a day. We would do the um, we would do all the underground uh, um, pipes in about two days. So we'd do all the underground. Then we'd get it inspected. Then we'd do the concrete back. Then we would do all the um, the uh, insulation and vapor barrier. And then we would do all the framing. Right. And, and each of those, you know, as long as you have the trades lined up, you're OK. The problem is that most people can't do that. So they'll hire a general contractor and a general contractor will have some of those trades lined up, but not all of them. Unless they're a big organization, they won't. They'll still sub out their electrical. They'll still sub out their plumber and there'll be delays because of that. So mm-hmm. it could take, you know, as little as four four weeks i've seen it as long as a year so and it just because of like disorganization having to go wow. back and fix things you know uh like it, and it can take a while because sometimes you like for example what can really mess up a, um, a renovation is not ordering materials ahead of time in enough ahead of time so that you're ready to go so for example you do all your renovations you know you have to get a window you're about three months in and then you say oh i'm gonna go get a window now well you go and order a window and you find out there's a three-month wait for windows right so you can't <laughs> right so you can't finish <laughs> Uh, that part of the house until you have the window and so like all of those things add up to more time so understanding and having somebody who's gone through it before and then pre-planning some of those big purchases that can uh, affect your timeline will um you know shorten that period of you know four weeks to, to 12 months so all of that you know even the permits like that little tip on permits that could save you six weeks Right. Mm -hmm. The, you know, that little tip on the windows that could take, you know, that could save you three months. Um, You know, fire doors are another one right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're not ordering fire doors or having fire doors, um, especially if you're doing like a duplex conversion, right, or you're separating units, you need to have the proper size fire door that, you know, that could take time because they, they might not have it. Right. So and understanding you know what's available and what's not that's that that affects the the process and the and the you know how you've how you've laid out your renovation so sometimes like you have um kitchens so I, i'm speaking from a duplex conversion perspective yeah, yeah, yeah um but like if you have a kitchen in the basement in a kitchen upstairs if you're if you have a kitchen on one side of the the basement and then your kitchen is on the other side of the basement you have a plumbing stack and your plumbing stack is probably at the other side of the house and now you have to do some sort of underground plumbing to get to one side to the other because you know you you haven't stacked the kitchens on top of the other which is a way to save some money right yeah. or you know you you do, your, your planner thinks it's so cool to move the the heating and like heating and you know furnace over to one side of the house well that means that you have to then get like a heat loss test or you have to you know you have to get additional plans done bcin plans done because you're moving the furnace uh right so 
and that can take another two or three weeks. So all of those things add up and, and that's why, you know, having that experience helps quite a bit and, and can shorten the time. That's amazing, Quentin. There's so much knowledge and wisdom there. So you mentioned fire doors. So I just want to make sure everyone understands in Ontario when you are renovating or creating a basement unit to ensure that it's legal. My understanding is the ceilings have to be a minimum height, right? Like at least mm-hmm. two meters. And then you need two points of egress, right? Like you need a door and at least one window where somebody can fit through. Is that correct? No, uh, it depends on the, the the unit. So if you have a unit that's totally separated and there's no other way to get into the upper unit, uh, uh-huh. you don't necessarily have to, by, by code, have uh, a secondary egress. I know it sounds oh. weird, but oh, okay. you don't. Um, what you do, but you're going to want to do it anyways. I would... I, I've only done I that. Too, I've, yeah. I, I yeah. was. I always had that uh, that egress. The um, the other thing is that it, it's a light requirement that that you need per bedroom. So each bedroom would have a certain amount of light requirement, and that light requirement, although it doesn't meet the standards of an egress window, actually can be uh, oftentimes the size of what would, uh, another egress window is, anyways. So mm-hmm. the light requirements are often. Um, because you have to expand usually the basement windows, which are usually small, you, you have to expand those anyways. Um, it's not much to expand it enough to, to be an egress. So you could, e- like if you had a two bedroom, you could have uh, two uh, egress windows if you wanted. Um, but those light requirements are part of that. Yeah, ceiling height, I think it's 6'5". Um, uh, everywhere. Uh, but in some, the thing is that there's no, every municipality is different. And each, they're like little kingdoms and these, these inspectors are like little kings in these kingdoms. And they, they say, yes, you do this here and you do this here because I, there's no standard. There is Ontario building code, but I can tell you there's no standard across Ontario when it comes to basement suites because one municipality will want shutoffs, uh, um, closeouts on, on the, like where, uh, air is coming in. Others will not. Uh, some will want shutoffs on the furnace. Others will not. Some will want two layers of safe and uh, safe and sound insulation with two layers of drywall, um, that, like Type X drywall. Others will mm-hmm. only want one layer. Like it, it's it, and so it's it's kind of odd, but you know understanding that in understanding that's why having somebody who understands the area is really important, whether it's an investor or a contractor. But yes, those are all parts of, and legalization is, has to do with like interconnected fire alarms, the fire doors when there's a connection between units, that's when you have a fire door. So, if, mm-hmm. or in the furnace room, like from the furnace room uh, outside mm-hmm. into the unit, that's, that's where you would have a fire door, um, you know, and all of that is, you know, part of the, um, the, the you know, what's required to, to make it legal by fire code and building code. Amazing. So I know the costs you were mentioning earlier were ballpark costs, but let's say you're creating a new basement unit. Let's say it's about 600 square feet. Safe to say about budget, at least $100,000 for that? Yeah, it depends on how good you are. You know, like you could be in it for like 65 to 100, right? It just depends on your finishes too. Like some people will have like used luxury vinyl tile. Other people will do like, you know, uh, like marble tile like it, it depends on what your finishes are right um because it, it's hard to it's hard to say you know if you're if you're just doing like a b class type of rental versus an a class rental you're gonna have um probably spend you know 15 or twenty thousand dollars more because of what you're what you're doing to the to the unit right in terms of renos are there any more minor touches that can go a long way in terms of whether it's reaching a higher appraisal price or getting more rental income for that reno. There's a lot that has to do with uh, making sure that the outside is uh, appealing. So if you're coming up to a property and you're trying to rent it, the, uh, usually a tenant will make a decision the first five seconds when they see a property. If it's like, you know, there's bushes everywhere and like grass is 10 feet high, right? So the, there's simple things like that. That's also helpful from an appraisal perspective. Um, the other thing is like, um, actually I put together a whole presentation on this, like on going through like increasing value for appraisals. And there's lots of um, big things you can do, like making sure that you have like a three plus two, 
right? Like adding bedrooms helps because it increases the rent versus a one bedroom in the in, in the basement, right? And but but also having a good size layout and having like a, a um, ample living room and light. Um, the other things that 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 are that are helpful other than you know from safety from a safety perspective like lights in the back um i, I like pot lights that the, they're just uh, especially led lights now the, they're very helpful um and there's little things that you can do that aren't very expensive that actually add a lot so i can actually see in the background there you have the 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 framing of your on your wall right yeah. and you and you're painting over it right that that framing is very inexpensive to do but it it is very it looks really nice and it looks very like it, and it's and it's appealing and those little so things my help. back my back wall here right here yeah is that what you absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, thank it, you thank it, you yeah but it, but it's appealing right it, it, it's very appealing and people enjoy those little things um you know putting a nice faucet on the on the sink right the, mm-hmm. like something with a, a rain head a shower head in the shower like doing things like that um just yeah. those little things are, are appeal to people and oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take pictures of those things and include yeah. them in the rental ads because yeah, those I've done little that. things I've done that before yeah. yeah like you know taking pictures of the 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 framing of the wall and you know all of those little things they they help to to uh let people picture themselves in the place right so and it helps for um, value as well. Okay, so now you're going through the renovation, but how do you get an accurate estimate on what the appraised value is going to be once the renovation is done? That's something that I don't quite understand, so I wanted to pick your brain. Yeah, so there's there's a, a number of different ways to do it. So one is you can hire an appraisal or appraiser to give you an appraisal of what a post-appraisal value would be. Uh, mm-hmm. It's expensive, but you can you can do that, and they can help you to come up with that. It's probably like three or three, four, or five hundred dollars to do, um, on top of the regular appraisal that they're doing. But that would give you an after repair value. Now the problem is that that's only accurate for the last ninety days. Um, you know, so we use different apps. I'm not a realtor, but I, I there's a couple apps that I would recommend that people use that helps them to identify what other comparable properties have sold for that are finished in the area um, in the last 90 days. Because after that, it's not really useful. Um, you can ask a realtor to give you comparables of what similar finished products would look like. You can act, what's nice about those is you can actually often get pictures of those um, because they're for sale, right? And those, mm-hmm. um, those pictures on the inside get, helps to illustrate the finishes that you'll need in order to get that appraised value. So comparables from realtors are very helpful. Um, that, like I said, there are apps. I just use the apps now and I can get an idea of what the, uh, what something is sold for in the area for about mm-hmm. the same price. And, it, and as long as the, the layout and the property looks about the same, I can, I can estimate the after repair value pretty simple, but I, I'm also a geographic expert. Like I, I focus on areas and I understand them and I target them. And so I could tell you what the value of the property is, right? Because I know that, right? That's what, that's what I do. And when I was doing duplex conversions, I wasn't doing du- duplex conversions in Thunder Bay and Windsor. And like I was doing them in Oshawa and Bowmanville and Curtis. That was it. I could tell you what they were worth because that's where I was focused. Um, and that's, that's another way is just, you know, how I said that you were, when you're looking at a map, you can say the areas that to stay in and areas to mm-hmm. avoid. Well, once you know that area to stay in, you'll have an idea of what the, the after repair value is because you're going to start, you bought a property there, you're going to start looking <laughs> and you're going to say, oh, this person sold for this, right? So you get an idea in your head of what it's worth. But yeah. um, realtors, uh, getting an appraisal and using the apps are, are handy. So I hope that interview provided some useful information to navigate the renovation section of the buy, renovate, rent and refinance real estate investing method. Next week, we'll be back with the rent section of this method. I will talk about the steps that I took to rent out my first rental property and Quinton will dissect everything. He'll tell me what I did well, what I did not do well, and he'll give some suggestions for 
additional steps that I can take to optimize the chances of landing an ideal tenant. Although I will say that I lucked out like crazy because I have an absolutely wonderful individual in my first rental property and I am so grateful for that. So guys, if you're enjoying the podcast, I would be so thankful if you can share the podcast with a few people that you know. Feel free to check out the show notes for links to social media and resources. You know that you can reach out to me at any time through social media or my email beyondmdpodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to you joining me again next week. Until then, stay well, stay savvy.